Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Satoshi Nakagawa. I'm a pediatric intensive care specialist in Japan. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to the rest of the world. Um, this is the session 12, uh, Challenges of Sepsis Management in Children Around the Globe. Uh, in the next uh, 19 minutes, we have the very attractive six speakers uh, from all over the world, and we will discuss the uh, uh, challenges of sepsis management on the globe. Uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, first speaker. Uh, first speaker is uh, Dr. Loren Schlappbeck. Uh, he is working at the uh, um, Sorrento, Lady Sorrento Children's Hospital in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, he's originally from Switzerland, and he has been working on the uh, sepsis in Europe and uh, Australia. And he will discuss on the uh, um, new definition in children. We need a new definition for sepsis in children. So please start your lecture, Dr. Schlappbeck, please. Uh, dear Satoshi, dear audience, thank you very much for the opportunity to present some of the challenges we're facing around pediatric sepsis definition. So, my name is Lorenz Lampa. I work in Brisbane as an intensivist. I will try in the next 10 minutes to give you a very brief overview of, first of all, why should we actually care about definition? What is the relevant relevance for definitions? But try as well to put the limitations of the previous sepsis two definitions, which represent the current sepsis definitions in children, and as well the lessons learned from sepsis three in adults put these into context and discuss how this will inform the approach that the Pediatric Sepsis Definition Task Force will take. So first of all, why should we care about sepsis definitions? This is an example of a study within Australia and New Zealand which tried to describe the epidemiology of sepsis and what we found out was that there were two to three times more children admitted to ICU with codes of invasive infections than children that were actually coded as sepsis or septic shock, but yet these children had organ dysfunction and needed life support. Such shortcomings in definitions then reflect as well on measures or estimates of the global burden of disease. This is an example from a recent uh, uh, systematic review trying to assess the global burden of sepsis across the world. And there are major differences in case definitions for sepsis which were used. So first of all, we do need good definitions to be able to accurately measure the sepsis burden. But the second reason for sepsis definition is that we need to reliably benchmark our performance. The recent recommendations for the best treatment of sepsis in children emphasize the need to have recognition bundles, resuscitation bundles, but as well performance bundles to measure the impact of current practice. And the very nice paper from uh, Idris Evans in Java uh, describing the impact of the New York State um, campaign to reduce sepsis mortality in children is a very good example of how such campaigns can make a dramatic impact on childhood mortality. But at the same time, there's a risk that these campaigns will lead to an increased awareness and change the, the diagnostic coding and labeling of sepsis. And this could result in an apparently better um, outcomes for children because less sick children are included in bundles and so the outcomes improve. Hence, risk adjustment and reliable characterization of severity is very important. These challenges are not altogether new, actually. And there's a, a nice citation that Stephen Simpson has brought up in a recent editorial around sepsis definitions. And he characterizes that sepsis, in fact, is a disease that is, in the beginning, difficult to detect but easy to treat. But over the course of time, it actually becomes easy to detect but difficult to treat. And this is indeed where some of the current challenges are, 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 are um, lying around. So there is an emphasis to move sepsis recognition to pre-hospital setting. And this is a good example campaigns trying to educate parents in the community more about sepsis to think early, could this be sepsis? But there's a risk that this will lead actually to an increase in, in um, suspected sepsis cases. So at the same time, while we do this, we need as well to, to be able to say, is it truly sepsis? And in order to do so, we need to have robust criteria that we can apply. So definitions as well have to be seen in the progression from infection to actually children that are at higher risk that develop organ dysfunction and finally as well multi-organ dysfunction or death. And the definitions need to be separated from criteria that allow early recognition of patients at risk, whereas we want to characterize actually as well those patients that did have the disease, you know, in, in, um, at the end. 
And this has to be considered in view of the traditional approach that sepsis 2 has applied. So the sepsis 2 concept assumed a progression of infection towards then the development of SERS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome to then further aggravation to develop organ dysfunction or severe sepsis and septic shock. However, this progression has been challenged because actually SERS is a feature of many, many infections seen and does not necessarily discriminate more severe infections. The other issue that we have with, with current sepsis definitions is that in addition to SERS, they apply organ dysfunction criteria which have been defined in 2005, however, the majority of which have actually have not been validated in that setting. And it is not surprising that actually this study from, the, from, from Scott Weiss has nicely shown that there is a quite an impressive discrepancy between physician-based diagnosis in contrast to proper consensus-based criteria for sepsis. So it seems that we don't apply the criteria very well. So the question is actually how, how well do the criteria perform? One good example of, of one of very few studies that have actually attempted to validate sepsis definitions was from Matt Bean's group in Uganda. And what they have shown in this um, cohort from a low-income setting is that sepsis definitions have a very, very high sensitivity to, to identify children with sepsis. However, the specificity was very poor, actually challenging the utility of this in clinical practice. And so in contrast, sorry, there was just one slide that has just jumped. Then sepsis 3 then actually said is we need to move away from just early recognition of sepsis. We need to have actually correct risk stratification and apply an approach that is based on, on big data using criteria that can be operationalized for different settings. So there's a much stronger focus now in sepsis 3 on research and benchmarking the focus of coding. So the sepsis 3 definitions define sepsis as dysregulated immune response to infection leading to organ dysfunction and ultimately worse patient outcomes. These definitions were made in cohorts not including children and the, the task force very specifically mentioned actually the need to repeat such an exercise specific for pediatric age groups. There's a few papers out there that have attempted to apply the sepsis 3 approach to pediatric age groups and one example is shown here. So what you can see here is that, for example, the increase in SERS criteria does only go, go with an increase in mortality if you reach three or four SERS criteria, which challenges the, the notion of sepsis two, that you need to have at least two SERS criteria. And at the same time, you can see that measures of organ dysfunction, such as SOFA score or the PLO2, are much more granular descriptions um, of severity. And not surprising in this study as well, what has been seen is that organ dysfunction scores, so here shown as SOFA and payload scores, in contrast to SERS, but as well in contrast to quick SOFA, have much better performance. So this shows that in principle we can apply a similar approach to sepsis 3, because sepsis 3 has been extremely powerful in using a large data-driven approach with rigorous systematic reviews and developing and then validating definitions. However, some of the shortcomings of sepsis 3 include the fact that most of these cohorts were actually based on ICU cohorts in high-income countries, as well as some eating ward cohorts, whereas the SOFA score is not applicable to many settings in the world, specific to pediatrics in particular ED settings, but even more so low- and middle-income settings. And hence, there is a need that we work forward and develop pediatric-specific sepsis definitions. And uh, earlier this year, the American Society of Critical Care Medicine and the European Society of Neonates and Pediatric Intensive Care Setting have agreed actually to pursue and support the Pediatric Sepsis Definition Task Force. And the departure, point of departure is to have the goal to, to revise sepsis definitions using the methodology that Sepsis 3 has used, but with a very broad, inclusive approach that uh, reflects the diversity of clinicians, but as well as the diversity of patients and healthcare settings across the globe. Specifically as well, these definitions will attempt to focus on certain areas which are specific for kids. For example, the early recognition of sepsis may di differentiate quite substantially from adults, as we have shown the Q-sulfur does not perform very well in children. Another example is as well that hypotension is a late sign of pediatric septic shock. And so the broader approach of the pediatric sepsis definition task for is to start with the launch which was in June at the Singapore World Congress 
And since then, we have now selected a, a large international multidisciplinary panel. The next step will be that we perform an international survey to several disciplines of clinicians to, to get more information around the scope, needs, and perceptions around psychiatric sepsis definitions. Based on this, we will then perform systematic reviews and delphi rounds and at the same time establish access to databases. We are keen to have access to databases not only from the PICU settings as well from ED and ward settings and importantly as well to include high income, middle income and low income settings. Using these databases, we will then endeavor to develop new definitions which will be validated in large databases prior to dissemination. So it is a very exciting time, and again, I would like to thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to present this project here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schlappberg. This is a very good overview of the uh, new uh, tours and new uh, sepsis definition for children. Um, I have a question to you. Um, without losing the uh, connection to the uh, early recognition, especially in the uh, uh, resource limited environment, um, what direction do you think we can make to make a definition of the sepsis? So, I think we need to differentiate three aspects. One aspect: what is the concept or the definition of sepsis? And so the adults have said sepsis is dysregulated immune response to infection leading to organ dysfunction. I think that concept as such is actually applicable to many, many different age groups. The question is actually how do we define criteria to measure this? And these criteria they need to be distinguished. First of all, there may be criteria that facilitate early recognition, but secondly as well, we want criteria that facilitate correct diagnosis. And the key aspect in here is the timing of databases used. So, as we all know, pediatric sepsis is a fulminant disease. And within 24 hours, a lot of things happen. Actually, the majority of mortality may even happen during that time frame. So, when we want to find the rivals that allow early, early, early prediction of children at risk, we need to look data that tell us this is how the child looked when the child came in. Whereas if we want to look at the correct diagnosis or description of sepsis, then we can look at how did this child perform, um, behaves over the first 24 to 48 hours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we are very happy to work with you to make a new definition for the pediatric sepsis in the, in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Thank you very much, Dr. Schlappberg. This was a very, very great lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to the second uh, talk uh, in this session. Um, second talk will be provided by the Dr. Robert Liu uh, in China. Um, the, the topic is improving sepsis care for children in China. Uh, Dr. Liu is the uh, leading pediatric intensivist in China, and he's working at the Children's Hospital of Fudan University in Shanghai. Um, Shanghai is a very big city, and uh, he is looking after the many patients from the emergency department to the pediatric ICU in the Shanghai area. And he is also the leading scientist in China um, from the basic life support to uh, advanced uh, life support, including the ECMO. So please start your lecture, Dr. Liu. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my honor to be here to introduce um, our workers briefly in, uh, on the pediatric success in China. And uh, as we know, success is supposed to be a big challenge worldwide. And so we kept carrying out uh, epidemiology investigation in China. During 2008 and 2007, the investigation from four tertiary pictures in Shanghai showed its mo mobility rate was 14%, and in which uh, mortality rate was 13%. Then from two tertiary pictures in Beijing, which is the capital of China. Uh, showed the morbidity later was 40% and the mortality later was uh, 11%. Currently, a new investigation is being performed nationwide, uh, which is especially focused on the initial six steps of the treatment bundle. Through this investigation, we found that the executive compliance of the guideline is still the main obstacles. 
and the big imbalance exists around China. So more efforts should be made to improve this in China. Uh, what have done before in China? Every four years, the newly published guideline was translated timely into Chinese by the PDH Critical Care Medicine Association. This highlights and the major changes in the new guideline was paid more attention to when we introduced it to our daughters. Then, the Chinese experts came up with a consensus on pediatric safety shock in 2006 and 2015, respectively. By the pediatric group of the emergency and the critical care medicine of the Chinese Medical Association, we attach importance to the key recommendations such as initial resuscitation, fluid resuscitation, antibiotics, source control, and hemodynamic monitoring, such as sonography or the non-invasive technicals. And hemodynamic stabilization with the inotropes and vessel active jaggers. We had, we had a couple of special forums in China to discuss how to implement the guideline, especially how to evaluate and deal with the three MS. Such the means, uh, microcirculation, microcirculation, and the mitochondrial in the early stage of success. The extensive discordance responding to the severe success and safety shock keep existing worldwide. Uh, in China, a proposal of a training project in pediatric emergency department has been read, has been raised to implement the golden one hour strategies. Concurrently, sing and single and uh, multi-center study for the effectiveness is going to be carried out. For pathogens detection and the antibiotics use, uh, quite a few years ago, the government required to get blood culture and early biomarkers, such as uh, procalcitonin, CRPC reaction protein, and interleukin-6, and uh, lipopolysaccharide, before utility of antibiotics. Recently, in China, experts consensus has been making to guide and assist early diagnosis with biomarkers, and uh, recommend to guide escalation or de-escalation of antibiotics. Up to now, nearly 90, 90%, 95% of cases in emergency with a suspected infection has satisfied this requirement in developed, area, developed areas, but it remains less in remote and less developed areas in China. Now, there is a big gap in different provinces of China due to medical environment, economic status, and culture. More efforts are needed to push the bundle strategies. We are developing chance for doctors from remote area and medically less developed areas to get trained through electric ICU, EICU training, including simulation training, special conference, or electrical education. As an effective and practical training curriculum, in China, simulation training projects are under process in our countries. Okay, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for your great overview in the uh, uh, thanks for in implementing the program in China. Um, I have uh, several questions to you, Dr. Liu. Okay. Uh, I think you have already done the uh, several clinical researches uh, with the uh, multiple uh, institutions. Um, what is the uh, finding so far in the uh, situation of the uh, sepsis in children in China? Uh, several years ago, we did uh, uh, two, PIC, uh, two uh, clinical researches about the epidemic origin uh, mm -hmm. in pictures. Okay, uh, okay. But now the new researches uh, are, coming out, are coming out now. Uh, maybe the next year we can get the get the tape data. 
And the second, yes, and the second, uh, we found uh, through these researchers, uh, our, our clinical researchers, uh, we found uh, across China, due to the different uh, uh, different uh, medical status in the different provinces, we can't uh, implement the guidelines uh, the equally. And uh, most of the uh, provinces, just like the uh, west, pro west province, west of China, um, this is uh, the, the 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 level is is lower for them to um, to uh, implement the guidelines. But in the uh, in the east of China, uh, maybe the developed uh, areas, we implement the guidelines um, maybe better. Uh, this is the second, and the third. Uh, for the different pictures, they use the guideline. Use the guideline. Um, maybe the dif different. They, when they use uh, diagnosis, the guideline uh, diagnosis is a sepsis or septic shock. They use the different uh, the criteria. Use the sepsis three in adult. Sometimes you use the 2005 criteria for the for the children. So this is the this is confusing confused. And the second, when they treat the cases, they implemented the bundle differently. The developer area we treat a severe sepsis or septic shock with the Guideline from one to three initial recitation, after recitation, or the uh, interpreters. But in the, in the less developed area, um, most of the time they choose um, many, uh, one or not one, choose uh, part of the bundle to treat them. So maybe the result uh, may be the different. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we understand that, that there is a confusion of the definition of sepsis in pediatric population, as uh, Dr. Uh, Schlappberg has already illustrated. Uh, adult has a mm -hmm. new definition. In the pediatric population, we don't have the new definition. We still use the uh, mm -hmm. 2005 definition in the pediatric yes. population. So uh, there's much confusion, but if we once we have the new definition, and uh, we can mm -hmm. uh, gather the uh, data in the pediatric population from the all yes. over the world, and this might be an improvement in the uh, sepsis uh, management, diagnosis and management uh, in the pediatric population. Mm -hmm. um, as you also pointed out, uh, there's uh, um, several. Um, <coughs> Um, gap of the uh, management level in, in, in within the country, and uh, you have already mm -hmm. uh, creating the working group in the, uh, China, and the, you have uh, working together with the uh, different institutions, and uh, I think this is a uh, promising uh, activity mm -hmm. in the uh, improvement of the uh, sepsis management in the, for the children. Yes, so. Uh, I think we have to resort to the uh, simulation training. I have to train the different level of doctors, uh, um, doctors or the residents to use the guideline uh, according to the guide, according to the uh, same guideline, uh, same uh, strategies. Okay. So we should treat them with simulation training. Um, you, yeah, I said you have already started simulation training, right? <coughs> and uh, you can create the several sepsis scenarios in the simulation training, and you can incorporate it, and you can do the uh, um, education in the emergency uh, area, mm -hmm. and also the uh, the novice young generation, including the residents. Yes. And so Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'd like to move to the uh, next speaker. Our next speaker is Matthew Greens. Uh, he is the uh, epidemiologist. Uh, 
he was working at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and uh, he is now moving to Uganda, and he's um, conducting the um, smart discharge program uh, in the Uganda. Um, if you already, please start your lecture, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to participate in this session on the challenges of sepsis management in children around the globe. Uh, today, we're going to talk for a little bit about the important repercussions of sepsis following hospital discharge, as well as some of the work that we've been doing uh, here in Uganda to begin to address this, this important issue. So there is a growing uh, evidence base that the burden of post-discharge mortality in children is quite substantial. A systematic review that our, our team did back in 2013 showed that in the, in the context of these limited settings, um, in hospital mortality and uh, post-discharge mortality uh, were, were roughly equal. Um, and all the studies varied uh, quite significantly with regards to the kinds of populations that they enrolled. Uh, some focused specifically on uh, infectious diseases like malaria or pneumonia, uh, while others uh, included a uh, um, more general cohort. Um, it, it was pretty consistent across the board that mortality after discharge uh, was uh, quite a, a significant burden of, of overall mortality. Uh, since this time, we've uh, continued to uh, compile the evidence and, and update our, our, our systematic uh, searches, and we're finding that even in the more recent literature coming out, that mortality after discharge uh, continues to uh, comprise a significant portion of, of overall mortality. And some of the important risk facts that seem to come up again and again in, in these studies included uh, malnutrition um, being probably the most important, but also uh, variables such as young age, prior hospital admissions, HIV um, infection, um, as well as pneumonia. So despite the fact that uh, post-discharge mortality um, is an important contributor to infectious-related uh, death, uh, this issue has been largely uh, neglected. I believe that the causes of this are, are, are wide-ranging, and, and certainly they are complex, but perhaps an important contributor to the fact that the uh, is the fact that the usual surveillance uh, systems in place in many of these affected regions uh, do not capture these deaths because uh, many of them occur outside of the hospital context, um, usually at home. Uh, that's these deaths um, often fly under the radar being unrecognized as, uh, as actual post-discharge deaths. I think another important issue to consider in this context is that there is limited knowledge around the, the concepts of disease recovery and, and convalescence. Um, by both healthcare workers and by caregivers, um, and, and I think also actually contributes quite a bit to uh, the lack of recognition um, of, uh, of post-discharge mortality. Uh, given the recent uh, sepsis uh, resolution by the World Health Assembly, I believe that we have a timely opportunity to begin to address this important issue. Um, indeed, I, I believe that addressing post-discharge mortality uh, will be um, an essential component of achieving the third sustainable development goal. A few years ago, our, our research team in Uganda did uh, a cohort study. Uh, this, this study um, enrolled children uh, from two different uh, pediatric um, wards in the southwestern part of Uganda. Uh, we enrolled children who were with uh, either a proven or a suspected infection who are between six months and uh, years of age. We enrolled about 1,300 children, um, and we found uh, that as many children died uh, within six months of discharge as died in hospital, and that was approximately uh, 5% in, in each case. Uh, most of the kids who, uh, about half of the kids who died after discharge died within the first month, showing that really this is, this is a, an, an issue that, uh, certainly occurs um, early on, but certainly also is an issue that persists um, even uh, for one or more months beyond hospital discharge. The uh, purpose of the study uh, not just to describe the epidemiology of post-discharge mortality, but also to develop a prediction model um, that would allow health workers to identify high-risk children. Uh, children who are vulnerable during the post-discharge period. 
uh, our idea was that we could use such a model in the development of a uh, post discharge intervention that focus uh, uh, our idea was that we could use this 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 model um in a post discharge intervention that focuses specifically um on on the high risk group uh, using the data that we uh, got from this uh this course study uh, we developed a prediction model that contained five uh, different uh, variables. Uh, the variables that we used included uh, mid upper arm circumference. This was by far the most important variable. Um, it included um, admission oxygen saturation, time since most recent um, admission, HIV status, as well as the coma score on admission. And with these five variables, uh, we were able to derive a prediction model that had uh, an area under the curve of 0.82, which is uh, uh, it's a statistic that measures discriminative capability of a model, which is quite good. Um, if we were to apply this model in a cohort of children, um, we would uh, be able to risk stratify kids into low and high risk groups. Uh, with this uh, risk stratification, we would um, capture about two thirds of children as being uh, low risk, uh, and the low risk kids would have about a 1% chance of mortality, and one third of kids would be labeled as high risk. And these high-risk kids would have about a 10% chance uh, of mortality. Um, in addition to the development of our model, there were a few um, uh, additional important findings that are, that are worth mentioning. Uh, so first of all, uh, about 90% of the enrolled children uh, met the consensus definition of sepsis. So this uh, merely demonstrates that post-discharge mortality truly is a problem in the context of sepsis. Second, uh, we found that two-thirds of the children who died um, after discharge died at home. Uh, this is a really important uh, finding as it shows that the hospital is generally the uh, the last point of contact for the most vulnerable children. Uh, thus, we believe uh, that this is actually an ideal point uh, uh, to begin to uh, test apply interventions to improve post-discharge outcomes. So, We've talked a fair bit about um, about some of the prior research, um, but the title of the presentation is about smart discharges. So where does the idea of smart discharges fit into this? Uh, so when talking about smart discharges, I like to bring in the concept of precision public health. A precision public health uh, is essentially the use of precise data to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of public health interventions. Uh, interventions to decrease post-discharge mortality are ideally suited to this approach. Uh, we can use our, our prediction models to, to um, identify the children uh, who are vulnerable prior to discharge. Uh, this, this data, therefore, can focus specifically uh, on, on vulnerable groups, uh, thus ensuring that the interventions do not unnecessarily burden uh, what are generally already strained health systems. It also doesn't overburden the, the, the caregivers who generally um, are, are very poor um, and uh, can't generally afford to uh, conduct intensive uh, follow-up. So we call this um, approach a smart discharge approach because essentially it's a smart way of discharging patients and, 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 and focusing specifically on those who are most vulnerable. So our, our group in Uganda has, uh, has conducted some, uh, some proof of concept work to see if, uh, if post-discharge outcomes can be improved. Uh, we used uh, um, an intervention that consisted primarily of, of education, but also uh, included simple incentives to reinforce that education, um, and, and also included a post-discharge back referral uh, for follow-up in the community. Uh, the, the back referral essentially um, uh, provided a, a patient um, an opportunity to seek care on day two, on day seven, and on day 14 um, to be reevaluated by a healthcare provider uh, within their community. Our focus really was on, um, on, on, uh, on referral back to the, the community where the, where the patient lives to decrease the, the travel burden uh, um, because many of the children uh, would have to follow up uh, at, 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 a, at, at a hospital that was uh, oftentimes unaffordable to reach um, a second and third and fourth time uh, soon after discharge. Using this approach, we found that we could increase health seeking uh, by uh, by threefold. Um, it, it, it went from about 30% to 90% uh, during the post-discharge period. We also found that the rate of readmission doubled from from 6% to 
Now, this means that children who otherwise would have been severely ill within the community were able to be cared for uh, within the hospital context instead. Now, we also found a reduction in mortality, uh, but this is not statistically significant. Uh, our, our study was never powered to, to de de detect this, but um, it, it's worth noting that, um, it, that the directionality makes sense given that we increased uh, post discharge health seeking and, and increased uh, readmission rates. So what are some of the key points that we can take away from, from smart discharges for sepsis? Well, first of all, um, it's important to, to recognize that post-discharge mortality is indeed a very critical issue in, in global health. A second, um, improved discharge practices, I believe, are, are key to improving outcomes uh, during the vulnerable uh, post-discharge period. Third, um, a risk-guided approach to, to discharge planning um, is, is a really important opportunity to, uh, to um, improve outcomes because it allows us to have uh, a, a more cost-effective intervention that focuses specifically on, on children who are at high risk. Uh, finally, um, uh, it, it, it's important to continue to engage uh, with uh, stakeholders, uh, specifically ministries of health, um, and also to work with, within our health systems to develop a receptive health uh, system environment in, into which um, improved discharge planning can be implemented. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for listening, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Well, thank you very much for the great uh, overview uh, on your uh, nicely um, started your project. project. Um, I think we have several questions. Uh, first of all, um, we know that you are identifying the risk factors for the uh, um, post-discharge mortality, and uh, you do the um, um, follow-up in the community. Who does this follow-up in the community in your program? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So, um, so our focus um, in, in our focus concept work is being primarily uh, having patients do follow-up at low-level health centers and with community health workers, either or. Uh, so in, in our region where we've been working, we've mapped out all of the health facilities um, within mm -hmm. the catchment area. Um, and when a caregiver um, and patient are discharged, uh, we um, find out where they live and we give the, the, the caregiver the choice of where they want to do follow-up in their region. So uh, we use a, a mobile application and it has all of the health centers in it. Uh, when we know where they live, um, we uh, uh, show them the nearest six health centers to where they live, and the patient chooses where they want to do follow-up. Um, and that is either generally a community health worker um, or a low-level health center um, in their region. Um, and we find that approximately one-third of caregivers choose to do follow-up with a community health worker and two-thirds with a health center. Um, and, and I think that providing them the choice of where to follow-up probably is one of the reasons why we had such a high rate of successful follow-up um, in, in, our, in our study. Because patients often know where they want to seek care. And if they're told to go to a specific place that they perhaps don't want to go to, they may not actually uh, conduct the follow-up appropriately. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And we also have the question from the uh, listeners. Um, the, your approach can be applicable to the uh, urban area or the urban area or rural locations. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Uh, applicable to what area? Uh, the urban area or the rural area as well. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we work primarily in a, se a semi-urban area, but I think that these principles can be applied to to both urban and rural. We haven't done much um, specific urban work, but I, I think that uh, the same principles apply, but the kinds of uh, centers for follow-up would be a bit different between rural and urban areas. Okay. And um, I, I understand the goal to reduce the uh, mortality in the long-term follow-up, and uh, um, um, what have you been achieved so far? For morbidity? Oh, yes, morbidity morbid and mort mortality. Yeah, so, so our focus primarily up until now has been on, on mortality. Um, mm -hmm. It's a fairly uh, easy outcome to measure. Um, yes. But I, I completely agree with you and with um, others who have, uh, who have questions about um, looking at morbidity. Like, we know that, you know, in, in, in the developed world, that morbidity is a, a big issue after sepsis, and there's more and more evidence coming out to show. 
that um, a, a large proportion of children have significant morbidity in the months or even years after sepsis. Um, and we are in the process of trying to begin to look at morbidity, um, but as of yet, we have not um, we have not begun to measure that. But it certainly is something that I think needs to be prioritized and um, and and done. But I'm I'm certain that uh, development and other and other um, quality of life measures would be actually affected by a severe infectious illness. Although we haven't really generated that data ourselves yet. Um, th- thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for sharing the, uh, your work in the uh, Uganda. It was very impressive, and uh, I think this can be uh, applicable to the area on the on the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we'd like to move to the uh, next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Mohammed Christie uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, he will talk on the sepsis from pneumonia and diarrheal diseases. Uh, Dr. Kisti is the uh, pediatrician and the intensivist in Bangladesh, and he has been uh, he has been doing the extensive work, uh, including the uh, application of bubble CPAP and uh, high flow carrier in the environment of the uh, pneumonia in Bangladesh, and he is also working uh, on the uh, diarrheal disease in Bangladesh. So please start your lecture, Dr. Kisti. Thank you, uh, um, uh, my dear um, chair. So uh, I will start with my title. Uh, the title of the presentation is Sepsis from Pneumonia and Diarrheal Disease. As you know that uh, sepsis is associated with very high case fatality. However, its appropriate management remains a challenge both in developing and developed countries. You know that um, among the um, estimated 5.6 million deaths globally in, in other than five children, 9% were due to diarrhea. Uh, and um, among um, 119,000 deaths in Bangladesh, which occurred in 2016 in under five children, 6% were due to diarrhea. So it is still um, enormous. And half of these deaths were due to sepsis. And bulk of these deaths occur, you know, that um, not only in Asia, but also in sub-Sahara Africa. And early recognition of sepsis before its progression to its consequence, like severe sepsis or shock, um, and simultaneous aggressive antibiotic therapy may reduce deaths. Um, Additionally, early and efficient fluid management uh, in children um, with severe sepsis may also help to reduce deaths. And uh, um, um, uh, actually, severe sepsis in children with diarrhea we often see present with the combination of pneumonia and severe acute malnutrition. And aggressive fluid management in such children may lead to undesirable effects like heart failure, cardiac arrest, and, and inhibent deaths. Uh, World Health Organization recommends actually relatively slower less aggressive um, fluid resuscitation in the management of severely malnourished children who present with severe sepsis, and mainly aiming to reduce this kind of adverse events. However, only large trial of rapid fluid resuscitation in developing countries, there is a, uh, there is a FIST trial, uh, which was done in children uh, actually without severe malnutrition uh, um, and also featuring severe sepsis was associated with OARS outcome. However, data on outcome of children with diarrhea, pneumonia, and severe acute malnutrition, which is the common scenario in developing country hospital setup, and who also present with severe sepsis, um, um, and also receive WHO-recommended antibiotics and fluid resuscitation, uh, we don't have sufficient data on those children. This is why... Um, we designed a trial, um, uh, uh, actually we designed a uh, chart analysis where we wanted to evaluate the outcome of children with diarrhea, pneumonia, and severe acute malnutrition who actually present with severe sepsis and uh, used to receive WHO recommended free resuscitation along with antibiotics. And we also um, investigated the risk factors of the severe sepsis. 
And for that, uh, um, we had done a retrospective case control study uh, from the data of the pediatric ICU of the Dhaka Hospital of the International Center for Diarrheal Disease and Research in Bangladesh. Um, and our study population uh, were the diarrheal children with pneumonia and severe acute malnutrition who actually uh, uh, admitted between April 2011 and July 2012 and all the children, uh, the under five children. And uh, we had uh, um, two comparison groups. Uh, one group had uh, severe sepsis, and, uh, uh, and, and another group didn't have the severe sepsis. So we had a total of uh, 404 children. Among them, 50 children didn't, did have uh, severe sepsis, and 354 didn't have the severe sepsis. And we define severe sepsis uh, with the objective clinical criteria following surviving sepsis guideline. And management was done with fluid resuscitation following standard hospital guideline, which is consistent to World Health Organization guideline. And uh, the patient also um, received um, um, the management with um, antibiotics and other supporting management following WHO guideline. And uh, um, if we see the uh, um, comparison, you can find that study children who had severe sepsis um, more often um, were young infant and more often um, uh, had the lack of BCG vaccination and uh, um, frequently presented with drowsiness, abdominal distension, hypoxemia, hypernatremia, metabolic acidosis, severe kidney injury, and hypocalcemia compared to those who didn't have severe sepsis. And most striking point is that uh, um, our study children who had severe sepsis had 40% death compared to uh, only 4% who didn't have severe sepsis, although those were also sick. And uh, um, if you see the uh, comparison of uh, other characteristics uh, uh, which uh, um, have been shown, they're comparable um, between the two groups. And finally, we have done the uh, logistic regression analysis uh, to explore the independent uh, risk factor of uh, severe sepsis in our study population. And we have found that lack of um, intake of BCG vaccination, drowsiness, abdominal distension, metabolic acidosis, and acute kidney injury are found to be independently associated with severe sepsis in our study children. Thus, our data conclude that the severely malnourished children with diarrhea and pneumonia presenting also with severe sepsis and treated with fluid resuscitation in addition to standard antibiotic and other supportive therapy recommended by the World Health Organization are likely to have higher case fatality compared to those without severe sepsis. And our study also identified several simple independent predicting factors for severe sepsis uh, those may help clinicians to initiate early intervention in diarrheal children with pneumonia and severe acute malnutrition, especially um, um, resource poor setting like Bangladesh and other parts of sub saharan Africa. And from that uh, data, we can recommend that um, 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 we can recommend also for the importance of an essential randomized controlled clinical trial with large sample, which could be uh, prospective, for the evaluation of efficacy of different fluid resuscitation strategies, uh, um, especially um, comparing uh, um, our prevailing WHO uh, um, recommended fluid resuscitation with or without ionotrope support in order to reduce death in such children. Because nowadays WHO didn't have any recommendation of providing um, anotropes in these children, especially children with severe malnutrition. Thank you for your patience, Harry. And now I'm, I'm inviting questions um, uh, from, uh, from the listeners.
Um, thank you very much for your very nice uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Gussie. Um I think we have uh, several questions. Um, regarding the treatment of the uh, severe diarrhea uh, and pneumonia patients, do you give the fluid uh, intravenously or already in, in the practice? In yeah, we uh, uh, religiously uh, uh, follow the uh, guideline of World Health Organization. If uh, um, a patient with diarrhea uh, present with shock, we used to use um, a, a IV fluid. And so we, uh, those who do not have the signs of dehydration but still uh, present with signs of sepsis as well as uh, Severe sepsis, we used to uh, give, give them fluid actually intravenously, which is recommended by the World Health Organization. Okay. When we look at the feed study by Dr. Kate Maitland, uh, there, uh, there's a number of significant patients with the uh, uh, severe anemia. Uh, how about in your population? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is a very good question. In our uh, uh, series, we didn't find a lot of kids with uh, a severe anemia, but there are a lot of kids who had uh, 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 moderate um, anemia. Uh, but and, and actually, irrespective of presence or absence of uh, severe anemia, those who had shock um, even after receiving the fluid resuscitation. That does mean that those who didn't respond to fluid resuscitation, all of them received actually blood transfusion according to the recommendation of the World Health Organization for, um, for the kids with severe acute malnutrition and shock. Yeah, in your treat treatment protocol, do you include the uh, inotropes to support the cardiovascular system? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Um, actually, although WHO didn't recommend this, in our hospital, we incorporated actually um, um, anotrope. Um, and it has been shown that those who receive anotrope, uh, they have the better outcome uh, compared to those who didn't receive the anotrope. This is why uh, uh, we um, are designing a new trial and hopefully um, by the next year we will going to uh, do this trial in our hospital and we have already submitted this for funding and uh, we have already published a chart analysis from uh, our series uh, uh, that those who received uh, anotrope and those who didn't receive anotrope, uh, there is a difference of outcome. It is published in the Acta Pediatrica by Charmin et al. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, in the, this current study, um, do you examine the uh, effects of the uh, bubble CPAP for the pneumonia patients, or this is just for the uh, total group of the uh, severe uh, sepsis or without severe sepsis? Yeah, this is a very important question. Actually, uh, the patient population which we have taken at that time, bubble CPAP trial was going on. So uh, it is before the uh, before the incorporation of the bubble CPAP as a part of the standard of care of this hospital. So uh, uh, um, those children didn't receive the bubble CPAP uh, um, 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 routinely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it, it was a very nice and well conducted uh, study, and uh, this is very very informative for the um, management of the sepsis in the resource limited area. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kisti. It was a very nice overview of the uh, um, your study. Thank you, Chairman, for your um, appreciation. Thanks. Um, let's move to the um, fifth speaker uh, of this program, uh, of the session. The uh, fifth speaker is, uh, is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Monu. Uh, she's, mm, she will talk on the uh, treating sepsis in district hospitals, uh, best returns on input. Um, Dr. Monu is originally from the UK, and uh, she has been working in the um, Africa, um, the Malawi, uh, for many years, and she has been uh, doing uh, extensive work in the Malawi. Uh, she is the pioneer for the 
APLS program in UK and Europe, and also the founder of the ETAT course for WHO um, in the African and the other region of the planet. Um, we are very happy to listen to the uh, Dr. Morinus uh, lecture. Good afternoon. I've been asked to talk about treating sepsis in district hospitals and what the best returns for our input would be. And I think before we do that, we need to just do a brief look at the scale of the problem and then think about prevention, diagnosis, always a problem, antibiotic resistance, something we're very concerned about, and management guidelines. It is indeed a big problem. There are many, many children living in low and middle income countries. We know that there are about 30 million cases of sepsis a year, and a significant number of those are in children. There was a recent review to try and estimate the number of episodes of severe bacterial infection in children were caused by either the pneumococcus or haemophilus. And it's clear that despite the vaccines, which are used quite widely, there are still many incidences, particularly of pneumococcal disease and a significant number of deaths. And on this map, you will see that the problem is mainly in areas of the world which are colored either red, pink or yellow. We should remember that all neonates are at risk of sepsis, but neonates in low income countries are particularly prone to infection and there are 20 times more infections in neonates in low middle income countries than in high income countries. And we should also remember when thinking of neonates that we have a significant number of maternal deaths of which 11% are due to infection. And we know that there are considerable risks and consequences of this, not least neonatal infections. So what sort of facilities are people working in? Well, WHO did a review of quite a number of uh, facilities in 54 countries and reported a lack of water, soap and sanitation in many of them. Now, this wasn't only district hospitals. This was uh, smaller units as well. But still, it's hard to deal with sepsis when you don't have basic necessities. So prevention is really important. It's usually divided into primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. And probably primary isn't our remit at the moment, but say, certainly secondary is. We should be teaching our mothers about danger signs and about communicating and communicate with them. Quality care is really important. And it's not just antibiotics, but it's having space and staff and being able to make a diagnosis. And then the tertiary preventions, monitoring our patients, supervising what's going on in the departments, and above all, remaining clean are of vital importance. Indeed, if we look at this, which was a review of what effect hand washing will have on outcomes, this is again neonates, you'll see that a mother keeping her hands clean, we can reduce mortality by 44%. The birth attendant hand washing, 19%. And omphalitis, if the mother keeps her hands clean, will go down by 24%. This is a simple intervention, but hugely important. Now making a diagnosis can be difficult because it's often empirical and it's easy to underdiagnose and equally easy to overdiagnose. In fact, if we look at how many people are having to make diagnoses, which is with vital signs, with or without maybe one or two lab results, tests, can overdiagnose 
maybe looking at the length of stay here, we have SIRS in 29% of admissions, but only two days in hospital, which suggests maybe that there's overdiagnosis. But if we do use antimicrobials, we must use them well. We must give the correct drug. In 2012, it was found that two-thirds of selected drugs were not available. Equally, in 2015, a half of antifungal doses were suboptimal. So we need to be careful with what we have. And then, of course, we all have concerns about antimicrobial resistance. Where we do have local data, we must use it to guide our first-line treatment. In Malawi, data has been collected over a large period of time. And strep pneumonia, for instance, has become increasingly resistant, especially after the vaccine was introduced. And that may well be because different phage types are now causing problems. But still, only 2.2% are resistant to erythromycin. We need to protect our macrolids. Looking at Staph aureus, about 11.5% are resistant to gentamicin. And of our MRSAs, about 10% of all isolates are positive. What we really worry about, those bacteria like E. coli, Klebsiella, Echinobacter, and other gram negatives. And if you look at these graphs, all the lines are on the rise. And they're showing us that keftriaxone, cipro, and gentamicin are increasingly more uh, inadequate for these particular bacteria. But the gram negative bacteria are a particular problem with nosocomial infections, and they tend to be the resistant bacteria. If we look at the geographical variants, of deaths from resistant bacteria, you can see that many of those are from Asia and are perhaps a significant but smaller number from parts of Africa. And indeed, between 2000 and 2010, the amount of antibiotics that were used increased by over a third, and most of that was in the BRIC countries. And they were mainly what are used for second-line treatment, cephalosporins, carbapenems, polymyxines. Probably due to over-the-counter antibiotics and irrational prescribing. Nevertheless, there are still more deaths caused by lack of antibiotics than resistant bacteria. So let's look at some treatment guidelines. WHO defines groups of infection into four. They talk about community acquired and community presenting, community acquired and hospital presenting, hospital acquired, hospital presenting, and then those that are acquired in the hospital but only identified in the community. And we're going to look at the middle two of those. The most important thing is not to forget that treating sepsis is a bundled care. It's not simply giving antibiotics, however important that is. We need to think of fluids. Are we controlling seizures? Have we prevented or are we treating hypoglycemia, managing fever? And perhaps most important of all, do we have good nursing care? What about empirical antibiotic treatment? Well, as I've said before, if you know your local susceptibilities, that will guide you for your first choice of antimicrobial. If you don't know whether it's meningitis or not, perhaps the child's too sick to be able to do an LP, then you must treat with longer courses of antibiotics. And with antibiotics, as with everything with sepsis, time matters. Now, looking at community-acquired and hospital-presenting pneumonia, and these are guidelines from uh, WHO, which have recently been reviewed, if 
You simply have pneumonia presenting at hospital, but there's only fast breathing and or chest in drawing. Then oral amoxyl is our first line of treatment, and that has not been changed. In severe pneumonia, where we've got some danger signs, then we must treat parenterally, and we would do it with ampicillin or penicillin and gentamicin. And we'll do that for seven days, five or seven days. Our second line treatment is keftriaxin. For, I, for HIV positive children, we will want to prolong the therapy for up to 10 days. And sepsis, sepsis again acquired in the community and hospital presenting. Well, if they're from the community, their first line treatment again is gentamicin and penicillin or ampicillin for 7 to 10 days. If there's risk of staphylococcal infection, we're going to add cloxacillin and we're going to give the treatment for a prolonged period of time. There's a group, and I've put their groups with, with green overlay. There are young infants who may not be able to be admitted to hospital. If they've only got fast breathing, we can treat with oral amoxicillin. If they have a severe infection, then we really should admit them. If they refuse, we can still give them uh, amoxicillin, gentamicin. Gentamicin will be for two or seven days, parenterally, obviously, and the oral amoxicillin for seven days. If, however, they're critically ill, they should be in hospital, and they will have parenteral ampicillin and gentamicin for seven days. That's our first line treatment. But there are another group, and we need to consider them, and they're the ones who've been in hospital for more than 72 hours. In many hospitals, this will be your malnourished children, or perhaps your neonates, perhaps children that have been in and out of hospital frequently. And so we need to answer that. Have they been there for a significant period of time? If that is true, is there a possible CNS infection? And if there is, or they're less than one month of age, then we should give them a third generation cephalosporin and amicacin for their first line treatment. If they have been in hospital for longer than 72 hours, or there's a risk of a gram negative infection, but they do not have a CNS infection, they are not under one month of age, then we should give keftriaxone or Cipro, with or without amicacin. Obviously, the choice is going to be dependent on what you're expecting. For instance, with Salmonella, you might want to give Cipro. But what if they haven't been in hospital that long and you're not worried about a gram-negative bacteria? Then we go back to what WHO was saying for our first-line treatment. Are they less than one month of age? If they are, we give penicillin or ampicillin and gentamicin. We give, there's that choice because we're worried about listeria uh, in neonates, though I have to say listeria is unusual in many low-income countries. If they're not under one month of age, they have not been in hospital for any prolonged period of time, we're not worried about gram-negative we're going to give penicillin and gentamicin as our first-line treatment. However, if there's possible CNS infection, then we're going to go to a third-generation cephalosporin. If we're worried about encephalitis, we should add acyclovir. And if there's a staph infection suspected, we must add cloxacillin. There's another problem. When we want to treat quickly, it's not just timely detection, but timely action. And we need to think carefully in each of our own hospitals as to who should prescribe where and what. Because the earlier that antibiotic gets in, the better the prognosis. 
So in summary, prevention is much better than cure. We should try and make a good diagnosis and then use first-line antibiotics appropriately, second-line antibiotics judiciously. Remember that bundled care and speed are important and do the basics and do them well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice overview uh, on the management of the district hospital in the resource um, limited area. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Moynihan cannot take uh, an answer to the question because this is a recorded uh, lecture. But um, this is a very good uh, overview. And uh, in her summary, in the um, uh, her points are well illustrated. Uh, prevention is better than cure, and uh, take a good choice of the uh, um, first line antibiotics. Uh, this is very important for the management of the uh, um, sepsis and uh, invasive infection in the resource uh, resource limited area. Um, we would like to move to the last speaker of this session. Our last speaker is Dr. Tex Kitson uh, from Canada, and he will talk on the sepsis uh, leading cause of death in children uh, worldwide. Uh, Dr. Kitson is a well-known uh, pediatric intensivist and emergency physician, and uh, he was the past president of the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive and Critical Care Medicine, and he's also the vice president of the Global Sepsis Alliance. We are very happy to welcome the Dr. Kisun uh, for the lecture. Uh, thank you very much, Satoshi, and I would like to uh, give greetings to my colleagues around the world on the occasion of the second uh, Global Sepsis Alliance World Sepsis Congress. And I would like to congratulate my colleagues who have spoken before me because they have given really a lot of food for thought and have shown where progress has been made in uh, the uh, recognition and treatment of sepsis in children. Uh, in my talk, what I would like to do is frame the discussion around uh, showing uh, the, the burden of sepsis uh, in children worldwide. And uh, I will close with some good news um, that um, much has been done over the past few years and much more needs to be done. So the most important thing I, I will speak about is what is sepsis? Uh, what is the burden, both mortality, morbidity, the economic and the social burden, and then have some concluding remarks. And one may find it strange in this talk to speak about what is sepsis. But uh, while most of us who are initiated would know that sepsis not only involves bacterial infection, but as you heard from Chisti in Bangladesh, pneumonia, diarrheal disease, malaria, uh, they all are can occur together, but uh, they can all lead to sepsis, dengue, Ebola, mixed infections, nosocomial infections, as Dr. Molo has spoken about. They can all lead to a combination of uh, um, multi-system failure, which may ultimately, if untreated, uh, lead to death uh, and disability. Now, the, uh, the uh, number of cases attributable to sepsis worldwide from the various uh, diseases that, uh, that are very common is still uh, uh, in debate. But there is good news in that uh, with the uh, Institute of Health Metrics Evaluation in uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, determining the proportion of these cases worldwide that uh, will contribute to sepsis. However, uh, earlier this year, uh, we did a study that was, uh, first author was Carolyn Fleischmann, a colleague of um, ours from Germany. And what we did, we looked at a systematic review and a meta-analysis of the pediatric sepsis epidemiology worldwide. What was very clear is that uh, there is a Data reported from very few countries, and it's mostly uh, in high-income countries and some in um, Asia. Uh, so we find that this is one of the major problems we have when we speak about the burden of sepsis worldwide. We have to do estimations. And you've heard uh, from Dr. Molno some of the estimates. You've, but uh, extrapolating from our figures on a global scale, we estimated there were approximately 3 million cases of neonatal sepsis 
and about 1.2 million cases of sepsis in a, chil in a children's age group. Now, uh, these figures obviously um, uh, are imperfect, and we hope over the next few years to really bolster these figures, especially in the uh, resource poor countries, low and middle income countries in the world. When we speak of the burden of sepsis, uh, the stark uh, 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 sort of burden we, uh, we think about is mortality. But mortality, in my estimation, or uh, in hospital mortality, is really the tip of the iceberg. It's, um, while it is large, large numbers of patients and while it is a high proportion of patients with sepsis who die in many parts of the world, Addressing both mortality and post-discharge morbidity, as you've heard, is very important if we are to make any inroads in sepsis. So I would say that the post-discharge mortality, the burden, while we know is as high as in-hospital mortality, is still not fully elucidated for the rest of the world. And indeed, morbidity uh, is a very high but we are now understanding what the extent of the morbidity is and what uh, may happen worldwide for these children um, in the long term. But uh, as a proxy, we can look at, um, if we look at hospitals uh, in many parts of the world, we can look at, uh, as a proxy, multi-organ dysfunction and sepsis and look at uh, the mortality and disability in these situations. And what we have found that... Uh, in cancer care in Pakistan, the mortality uh, can be very high with multi-organ dysfunction. 70% of these children who enter an ICU have a mortality of 30%. Uh, this is not unusual, and similar figures have been found in other uh, uh, studies uh, from Pakistan, from severe malaria in India, um, in Rwanda, and in uh, even uh, the United States um, in patients with uh, stem cell transplantation. So one can say that if we look at the tip of the iceberg, we know that uh, multi-organ dysfunction is high in children in ICUs and mortality is high, but we have not uh, quantitated the disability. Now, uh, the situation, um, on the one hand, we have been able to decrease the uh, number of deaths over the um, uh, the past uh, the period of the Millennium Developmental Goals. Yet we know that uh, children in low-income countries are faring worse nowadays, and in fact, they are nearly 18 more times likely to die before the age of five, whereas a few decades ago they were 14 times. Also, um, I'm pleased with this Congress. We are speaking about both um, um, maternal and neonatal sepsis in the next session because the death of a mother is disastrous. And if a mother dies uh, in a perinatal period, her newborn has approximately 90% chance of dying. And under five children, 50% may die uh, in, the, in the coming years. So I think it is important to think in terms of both maternal and newborn sepsis. The tragedy of stillbirths also, most of the stillbirths that we see high proportion occur in Southern Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that this is, an, uh, uh, some of it is contributed to by lack of perinatal care and infections. And again, we have not highlighted this uh, 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 burden uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, when we speak about uh, morbidity from sepsis, again, as I mentioned, we are now understanding more. And while some work has been done in uh, resource-rich areas, for instance, the United States, demonstrating that organ dysfunction is very common as the PRISM score or any form of dysfunction score, uh, uh, sort of severity of illness score increases, um, those with poor outcomes after sepsis can range uh, up to even 40% of children. And much of the poor outcome, that when we speak of poor outcome, uh, is children may have pain, dis uh, feeding difficulty, learning difficulty, in fact, post-traumatic syndrome and sleeping problems, etc. that has not really been attributed to the uh, issue of sepsis itself. I've always said that sepsis also has an economic and social burden, and I think that uh, Dr. Muller in her talk has pointed out some of the issues that we need to face, but there is no doubt 
that the the socioeconomic burden pertains a lot to poverty. Poverty leads to decreased food security, which leads to undernutrition, which may uh, decrease the immunity, uh, leading to infections, um, which can lead to uh, mortality. In addition, undernutrition also leads to non-immunological factors to uh, perpetuate disease severity, such as decreased respiratory muscle tone, uh, prone to dehydration, poor cardiac function, that can all lead to uh, mortality. Poverty also uh, is associated with poor living conditions, increased pathogen load, and and therapy, as well as decreased access to healthcare and social support, and hence the importance um, uh, of an, uh, understanding the entire context in which the child lives and uh, how we uh, intend to treat and to address uh, post discharge mortality, as pointed out by my colleague Matt Weens. The issue of infections also is self perpetuating, leading to decreased appetite, increase. Uh, uh, decrease absorption, which again is going to perpetuate uh, the nutrition. The other factors that are on the horizon right now that uh, is has the potential and is increasing the incidence of sepsis in many parts of the world, and uh, warming climate uh, is leading to more dis- uh, disease outbreaks. And indeed, uh, if the current trends in temperature go uh, continues, we may have more and more disease outbreak and reverse much of the gains that we have made in public health over the last decades. In addition, we also have large cities and there are more individuals in the world living in urban areas and large townships in in ghettos and we have not really understood the disease implications, especially for children in these environments. And in the next few years, there are many mega cities in the world that may pose major problems. Uh, the other major issue has been mass migrations, um, ac- um, indeed across the world. We have um, seen the mass migrations in Europe, and as well as the the large migrations uh, in Myanmar and Bangladesh that have uh, really been a uh, uh, Tragic in the sense that these are areas that can lead to um, foment large outbreaks, um, especially the most vulnerable being mothers and children. So with these factors in mind, we have to be very vigilant. And while uh, we have made gains in sepsis, uh, the burden is likely to increase if we do not address many of these conditions. Indeed, it is recognized in many parts of the world, the, the overlay of malnutrition also, which would be prevalent in these communities. Uh, in fact, um, uh, it has been highlighted that there, uh, there's high m- mortality, uh, approximately 50% of uh, childhood infections are complicated by malnutrition, and it leads to economic loss and potential in a child, as have been recognized in many parts of Africa, including Sudan. Indeed, if one looks at the Life years lost uh, as a cause of um, of um, across the world. One can see that the major contributors to life years uh, lost in the world and disability are lower respiratory tract infections, malaria, sepsis, and other disorders of a newborn, a measles, whooping cough, etc., which led uh, Matthew Bond, the Harvard economist, to state that uh, infectious disease are systematically dealing with human resources. I think this is something that we need uh, to be cognizant about. And uh, uh, in our role of advocacy, this is very important because not only is the the sepsis burden uh, dealing with mortality and morbidity, but there's a major burden to society and there's a major burden to families worldwide. And uh, as uh, highlighted by... uh, my colleague Matt Weens, that two thirds of these fam, uh, children who are treated, uh, they die at home. Um, so these are tremendous emotional burden to families. Well, in conclusion, I think that uh, the, we have made gains during the Millennium Developmental Goal, uh, but we are now in the period of the uh, United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals, and there are several. Um, uh, aspects of goal number three that pertains to uh, the issue of sepsis in uh, children as well as mothers. Uh, the goal to reduce mat- global maternal mortality to less than 70 or 100,000 
as well as reduced neonatal mortality to less than 12 per thousand and under five to less than 25 per thousand, as well as the aspirational goal of ending of communicable disease and achieving of universal health care access to safe, affordable health care medication and vaccines, as uh, highlighted by Dr. Molno, are all uh, goals that over the next uh, few years uh, we need uh, to uh, continue addressing. I think that the uh, good news has been the uh, World Health uh, um, Assembly adoption of the resolution for sepsis. We have also made gains, as I said, uh, in trying to tease out um, the the, uh, global burden of disease for sepsis. But we need more data worldwide. We are now highlighting and addressing the issue of uh, post-discharge morbidity as well as mortality. But the global implications for the resolution um, is that we need to look at uh, all factors. And while all the uh, the different solutions may not be in our toolkit, we need to uh, make strategic partnerships to address inadequate prevention, inadequate and poorly educated workforce, the poor treatment, high antimicrobial resistance, as already pointed out. We need to look at disasters and pandemic, education of the public such that they understand uh, the danger signs and health-seeking behavior. And more importantly, we need adequate research, uh, ongoing research, especially in um, uh, uh, low- and middle-income countries. And... uh, uh, addressing the long-term consequences of sepsis. I'd like to um, uh, thank the listeners for, uh, for their attention, and I will um, uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kissin. It was a very nice overview of the what should be done uh, for to, to improve the sepsis management for the children uh, all over the world. Um, due to the uh, global warming phenomenon, uh, especially in the northern hemisphere, we often see the, uh, we sometimes see the dengue in Japan recently, and, and also we have the RSV, uh, all year round. This is a kind of tropical effect. And, uh, and nowadays we have, uh, more needed to be collaborated between the developed and the undeveloping world in terms of the research of the infection and the sepsis management. Yes, no, that's a very good point. In fact, indeed, uh, I think it was Paul Farmer who a few years ago made uh, the very astute observation. He said that infections do not respect borders and they travel across borders fluidly. And more so with climate change, now mass migrations and air travel, the infections travel fluidly across borders. But the problem we have at the present time is that uh, policies uh, limit drug drugs, treatment options, and uh, in fact, humanity uh, stops at borders. And hence, uh, the reason for working together and developing these um, regional alliances and community of practices is really to break down this barrier of borders because you're right that uh, with infectious disease, none of us are immune regardless of where we live. And I know in Canada, we have um, uh, are not really well prepared uh, to look at um, and treat infectious disease uh, from tropical countries, although almost 25% of Canadians were born overseas, uh, overseas and almost half from tropical countries. Yes, that's the truth. Um, uh, thank you very much for the great um, overview of the uh, um, what, what should be done for the sepsis in the next 10 years or 20 years. Um, in terms of the pediatric sepsis, thank you very much. Um, th- uh, I, w- I will also thank the uh, audience to participate for the uh, second World Sepsis Congress, uh, especially the uh, um, this session, uh, challenges of sepsis management in children around the globe. Um, I also appreciate the uh, supporters for the Congress. Uh, without the supporters, uh, we cannot achieve the, uh, um, this Congress very successful. At last, uh, we'd like to uh, ask the audience to visit the uh, website of the uh, World uh, Global Sepsis Alliance, also the World Sepsis Day uh, website, and uh, 
uh, I would like to ask your contribution to this movement uh, all over the world. Uh, thank you very much for participating in the session, and I will conclude this session. Thank you.